Good afternoon, Fun Factory Children's Adventure Centre. How can I help? Hello. I was wondering if I could inquire about booking a children's birthday party. Have I come through to the right place? Yes, you can book right here on the phone. Have you decided which party you want to have? Is there more than one kind of party? Yes, we have three different types catering to different needs. Shall I go through them for you? Oh, yes, please. Right. The first one we offer is a very physical and exciting one, which we call the adventure party. Children who attend this party can try to find their way out of our maze, which can take quite a bit of time. Sounds interesting, but I don't think a maze will keep them occupied for the whole party. What other things can they do? Well, they'll also get the chance to do some climbing on our outside activity wall. They'll be supervised, of course. We finish off the activities with a mystery walk. One thing with this party, though, is that it's aimed at older children, young teenagers, I mean, because it's not suitable for young children. Lunch, cake and other things to eat and drink are provided, but we do ask parents to make sure that their children have a change of clothes. It can be quite muddy outside. Right. Well, my daughter is 11, so that's probably not for her. What other parties do you have available? Ah, she might enjoy the magical party. They get to see a fantastic magic show, but they also get to participate. Our magician teaches children how to do simple magic tricks. Hmm, I'm not too sure. It sounds a little young, really. We advertise it for children up to 10, but we've had older children there before and they've enjoyed it. Of course, food and drink are included and they get a free magic set, too. Attendees also receive a gift bag to take home with them. Do you have anything, um, a little more educational? That will be our fascinating science party then. We've only recently started offering this one, but it's proving popular. We have a professor come in to do demonstrations of experiments for the children. It's really exciting and the kids always seem to enjoy it. We have smaller things for them to do after the demo. It's very interactive and perfectly safe. This sounds more like what my daughter would enjoy. Let me check. Yes, it's for children between the ages of 7 and 12, so perfect really. For this one, it's essential to book early. OK. Is there anything else I need to know about the party? Uh, yes. We need to know if your child or any other party goers have any allergies since we're providing refreshments. An email will be fine to let us know if there are any things we need to avoid. Super. I think I'd like to book that last one, please. It sounds great. Wonderful. I'll just need to take a few details. Good morning and welcome to Taylor's Dockyard. I'm thrilled to have you here for my talk this morning. I'm going to run through the most exciting features and exhibitions we have for you to explore and then I'll talk you round our maritime site. Now, for our younger visitors, we have a very interesting workshop which is an exclusive for today only. Our master crafters are going to be demonstrating how to make model boats out of wood, and you can even make your own. Adults, all the children will be supervised by qualified staff, so you can enjoy the rest of the site if you'd like, or stay and build your own too. Once you've built one, why not see the real thing? The star of our site is HMS Mouse, named for her speed. She is the only vessel of her class still surviving, and so we're incredibly proud of her. On board, you can visit the engine room, and you also get the chance to dress up like sailors. And if you want to see what it was like for the person at the top, go along to the captain's room. If, however, history is more your thing, we have a special place for you to visit, which is as much for adults as it is for children. 
The history of the dockyard can be found in the timber sawmill, which I'll show you on the map in a moment. Inside the mill, you'll see an exhibition on the naval history of the site, as well as knowledgeable guides who will be able to answer any of your questions. In addition to getting information from the guides, you'll find education packs for students wishing to do any further research on maritime history, and these are free. Finally, I want to tell you about our temporary rope-making exhibition. This is housed on the upper floors of the mill. You'll discover why rope was so important to the workers of the dockyard, and even try your hand at twisting some rope. It's not easy, though. Right. Have you all got your maps handy? So, as you can see, here we are at the front of reception, directly in front of our star attraction, HMS Mouse. We suggest going round in a clockwise direction so that you end up at the gift shop, which is just to the right of the reception building as you look at your map. There you can buy all sorts of souvenirs of your visit. As you start your tour, you'll see four buildings on your left, that is, furthest away from the water. The first building is our offices, but you shouldn't need to go in there unless you've lost something. That's where our lost property office is, and also our first aid room. The next two buildings are dedicated workshops, and that's where you can make things to take home with you. The final building is the toilet block. There's access for everyone there, but if you have a problem getting in, please do come to the office and let us know. In the far northeast corner, you'll find an extensive play area, just behind the mill next to the water. The building to the west of the play area is our restaurant. Adults, there are tables where you can sit outside and watch your children in the play area, so everything is safe. Leaving the sawmill, you'll pass over a bridge where you can get magnificent views of both HMS Mouse and the sea, so don't forget your cameras. Unfortunately, the first building you come to is closed at the moment. That's the Sailmaker's Building, and we hope to open that in the near future. However, do take a look in the woodshed, which is the second building to the southwest of the closed building. The first is actually an old storage shed we don't use anymore. In the woodshed, you'll see a display of some of the wonderful objects that have been made here at the dockyard. And that's it for now. If you have any questions for me, I'll be here in reception. I hope you have a wonderful day, and don't forget to follow us on social media. Hi, Jan. I'm glad I caught you. Oh, hi, David. What's up? I'm having difficulty knowing what to include in my essay on electric cars. Have you done yours yet? I'm still in the planning stages myself. I would have written it sooner if I hadn't needed to finish off my French coursework. Oh, no. I forgot you had that. It must be difficult. But at least you'll be able to communicate when you go on holiday. Well, I haven't even been there yet. What makes it worse was that I first had to write it all out by hand. Is your laptop still not fixed? That's been a long time. I know. In the end, I typed it up at the library using what I'd written. Anyway, back to our essay. If you want, we could go through what we've got. Thanks. I think that'll be helpful. Right. I've got so many positives of using electric vehicles that I don't know whether to include them all. I'm definitely going to write that electric cars save money. The fact that they're cost-effective is a big bonus for consumers. I thought of that, but decided against putting it in. I want to focus more on environmental advantages, such as zero emissions, which leads to cleaner air. 
I think that's going to form the main argument in my essay. I know that's why they're becoming more popular these days, but I don't think I'm going to go into increasing sales specifically or how convenient they are to use. I think I'll just stick with the environment. I think you're right. Speaking of environmental issues, I am planning to include the fact that they are much quieter. Ah, noise pollution levels. Yes, same here. I think it's a really valid point. It absolutely makes a difference to the quality of people's lives. So, shall we move on to look at the negatives? At first, I found this difficult, but there are a few that I found. Yes, me too. I think the biggest issue I got was that there aren't enough charging points for the number of cars that are predicted to be on the road. Yes, I had that as well. It doesn't help that charging takes a long time too, so drivers might be stuck in one place while their car is recharging, which can be really inconvenient. Exactly. And once it's charged, you're still limited in how far you can travel. This means that you get very little mileage off one charge, and then you have to recharge it, which might be frustrating. And even if you charge at home, you'll be faced with big electricity bills. And, to add to that, some people may not be able to afford an electric car. Buying one can be very expensive, so that'll put some people off. Not to mention that there's a limited range of cars for people to choose from. That's true. But I'm sure it'll change as more models come onto the market. Did you find any other disadvantages? Actually, one of my advantages can be classified as a disadvantage too. I think it's great that electric cars are so quiet, but others see it as a negative point. Really? Yes. Some say that silence may in fact cause accidents. I'd never really considered it before, but the more I think about it, the bigger a problem it might become. I suppose road users and pedestrians may not hear the car coming. I see what you mean. Maybe for our next essay, we need to look at how these issues can be solved. Shall we just go over what we've done? Then I think I might be ready to start writing. Right. To continue our lecture series on water features of Earth, today's lecture is on one of the greatest natural wonders found on the planet, Niagara Falls, situated in Ontario, Canada and New York State in the USA. We're going to look at the history and formation of the falls, alongside efforts to preserve the area. Although we might assume that Niagara Falls is one waterfall, it actually consists of three separate waterfalls. Horseshoe Falls, the biggest, stretch across the border between the USA and Canada. Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest, and American Falls both lie in US territory. The combination of all three makes Niagara Falls one of the most well-known waterfalls in the world. Scientists estimate that the falls were created during the last ice age which is also commonly known as the last glacial period. It is generally agreed that this era finished around 12,000 years ago, and it potentially began over 100,000 years ago. At this time, ice covered a vast area of North America in what is known as the Wisconsin glaciation. The majority of Canada was enveloped in ice, along with various sections of the northern United States, including New England and some of Idaho. Then, of course, the ice started to retreat or melt. During the melt, the excess water started to fill basins of land, which would eventually become the Great Lakes. Once the lakes had reached breaking point, they drained into the Niagara River, which flows north from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. As the water flowed, 
the river cut a large gorge into a cliff face, thus creating the falls. However, the falls that we see today are different to the ones that were created almost 12,000 years ago. In fact, because of erosion and falling rocks, the falls have changed location, moving further south by nearly seven miles. Scientists believe that erosion continues today at a rate of around 30 centimetres each year. By this calculation, Niagara Falls will have ceased to exist in 50,000 years, as they will have eroded a path travelling 20 miles to Lake Erie, where they will disappear. The erosion process is helped by the annual freezing of water and gradual melt. Horseshoe falls are also evidence of the change, as they have altered shape from a slight curve to the more familiar V-shape we can see today. Now, of course, the falls bring a lot of revenue and tourists to the area and aid energy production, more on that a bit later. So efforts have been made over the years to help preserve the falls and slow the rate of erosion. Originally, the volume of water which flowed over the falls amounted to 5.5 billion gallons every hour. You can imagine that this vast quantity of water is quite destructive. As a result of this, the US and Canadian governments have attempted to reduce the amount of water flow. They have done this by constructing barriers under water which help to redirect the flow. As well as this, they have strengthened the top of the falls using metal bolts. In 1969, the American falls were completely dried by creating a dam to divert the water over the bigger horseshoe falls. This allowed for observations and repair work to be carried out, such as strengthening the riverbed. However, probably the biggest benefit and method of preservation is the production of energy. The falls at Niagara are a historical first because the world's first large-scale hydroelectric facility was opened at the site in 1895. Nowadays, electricity plants in both countries bordering the falls generate enough electricity to power just under 4 million homes. That equates to nearly 5 million kilowatts. There are now five power stations on the Niagara River generating all this energy. This diversion for power generation has altered the flow of water over the falls and has divided opinion. On the one hand, diverting the flow helps the preservation of the falls for future generations and alleviates the pressure that erosion places on the surrounding natural structures. Visitors to the area probably don't even notice that the falls are not at full capacity and accept them for what they are, especially if they have never seen them at full flow. However, opponents of this believe that the falls should revert to their original flow, stating that the intervention of energy production is unnatural and is changing nature's intention. If the falls were allowed to go back to their original state, it might be an even bigger spectacle to observe, but it would put the infrastructure surrounding the falls at a greater risk of quicker erosion, thereby destroying the very spectacle opponents would like to see. Additionally, by doing this, the energy production for thousands of homes would disappear immediately. So, although there are arguments for and against, it is probably likely that a reduced flow over the falls will remain in place. But what both US and Canadian governments have done is to reduce the flow over the falls during the night. This allows more water to be diverted to the power plants and ensures that during the day, the falls showcase their natural beauty. So we've looked a little at the history and formation of the falls, as well as preservation efforts. Now, let's have a look at the tourist impact on the local area.